Thank you very much. I'm here to uh, talk to you about econ economic security in the digital age, where uh, we've entered, since uh, the digital economy uh, uh, has taken off, uh, we've entered a world in which uh, risks are all over the place for workers, individuals, households, and even companies. And uh, I wanted to discuss discuss what could be done or what could be imagined to cover those risks uh, in, in an economy that's radically different from the one uh, which prospered in the previous century. Uh, hence the picture of Roosevelt who basically created the welfare state for a mass production economy and since we're not in that economy anymore we need maybe to reinvent the welfare state to take care of the risks to which uh, people are exposed. So um, currently we're seeing uh, so, uh, something quite frightening which is the disappearance of the middle class. The whole model in the 20th century was uh, organized uh, around the majority of the population that belongs belong to the middle class. The middle class were people well paid, living in uh, nice houses, owning cars, uh, uh, well, having a good life, basically. Today, uh, we're seeing that we're witnessing the disappearance of the middle class, and uh, more and more, there are only two kinds of jobs. There are the lovely jobs on the left. Uh, this is Paul Bettany in a very in a beautiful film about finance called Margin Call, and in that film, uh, the character he plays explains everything about his own individual economy. So the money he earns, uh, what, uh, what he allocates uh, it, uh, his money to, etc., etc. So those people, they work hard a lot, but they're in finance, they're in uh, law, they're in big corporations, they're engineers in uh, uh, digital giants. Everything's going okay for them. They're, they have the lovely jobs of today. On the right are the lousy jobs in retail, in manufacturing, in office, routine work. More and more people have lousy jobs, which, is a lot of econ which means a lot of economic insecurity. They are not well paid anymore. They can be fired at any time. They work part-time without having a choice. And they don't have the benefits that go with uh, traditional uh, wage jobs uh, in the previous models. So in the middle, there's nothing left, or less and less, less and less middle class, more and more people out, uh, up there uh, earning a lot of money, and the majority of people uh, having lousy jobs. So the welfare state is in crisis for that reason, because the welfare state relies on taxes paid, for, ta paid by the middle class, and taxes are what cover uh, basically the costs of the welfare state. It's because we have many workers paying a lot of taxes that we can afford the, the welfare states. And when the middle class disappears, then you can't have a welfare state anymore. And you have politicians like um, David Cameron or George Osborne who, are, who, who just got re-elected in the UK because uh, there's now a consensus apparently in uh, developed countries uh, op uh, in developed countries that we can't afford the, the welfare state anymore because there is no middle class to pay for it anymore and so we have to dismantle it and to reinvent uh, uh, a, a new model. So, and yet uh, there's a lot of wealth created around because we're in the process of creative destruction. After the technological re revolution triggered by digital technology, uh, n many, many entrepreneurs are inventing new business models, new products, new services, and those products, services, business models meet uh, customers who are willing to pay for it. So, w uh, whereas the uh, many jobs uh, linked to the uh, previous model are disappearing before our, our eyes, uh, many jobs or many jobs could be created thanks to that wealth that's created by entrepreneurs inventing new business models and deploying them at global scale. So this is uh, well known and has been, uh, was theorized by Schumpeter obviously and uh, Clayton Christensen in uh, The Innovator's Dilemma. So the new jobs, what are they? They're 
quite different from the jobs in, in the automobile factory uh, uh, in the previous century. This is a woman preparing a bed for, um, uh, uh, um, uh, for a customer on Airbnb. And on the right, it's a driver working for Lyft. And, and the, uh, the common point between those two jobs is that they are, they are in the so-called on-demand economy. Uh, those people don't earn wages. Um, they sometimes they work a lot because they have many customers. Sometimes there isn't any customers. Sometimes they choose not to work because they have they have other business to attend to. And um, uh, what's more important is that while working in those jobs that are basically freelance jobs, they are not covered by the welfare state because the welfare state, especially in the U.S., but also in many other developed countries is directly linked to uh, wage earning. If you uh, a full-time employee in a, an ordinary corporation earning a wage, then you're covered by the welfare state. If you're a freelance making uh, ends meet, uh, uh, generating income streams like uh, Brian Chesky uh, uh, t told it, on uh, the great, the huge platforms of the the Andaman and the sharing economy, then you're not covered by the welfare state because there isn't any category to put you into. And so, uh, it's uh, well, it's frightening because more and more, uh, a lot of people will work on those platforms in the future, and. Even the wage earners, because a lot of us are still wage earners, but a lot of wage earners will work more and more in companies that live in the edge of failure in the digital economy because of network effects, because of increasing returns, because of constant innovation. Companies live and die in very, in quite shorter time span than before. You can. You can't expect when you join a company in the digital age that uh, it will live forever. You may uh, have an employer and all the security that goes with that, and suddenly, in a few months, in a few years, your employer will go bankrupt and you will be without a job. So the age of unicorns, a company rising up to $1 billion valuation, it's also the age of failure because most of us work for startups who won't find their market, who won't find uh, their business models, and most of us uh, work for old corporations who will disappear like Kodak, like Alcatel recently because they can't live in that age where you have to in innovate constantly. So there are many risks, uh, e both on the, uh, the platforms of the undermanned economy and in traditional corporations because th those corporations are not immortal. So what welfare state could we invent uh, to cover those risks? Some are traditional risks like getting sick or getting old uh, without being able to work anymore. So those risks, we know how to cope with them. Some countries are more advanced like European countries. So some countries only join the club of ha uh, having um, um, a mandatory social insurance for covering healthcare like the US. But, but basically, we, we know those risks and we know how to cover them. But there are also new risks that are uh, getting critical in the digital economy because the digital economy changes so many things that, so that suddenly uh, um, risks that were non-critical in the previous model become critical. One of them is housing in the digital economy where value is created not around factories out there in the country or in the suburbs, but around dense metropolitan innovation clusters like San Francisco, like Paris, like London, or like um, other great cities suddenly everybody has to live in those cities, both the entrepreneurs that are creating uh, companies in the cities and the engineers that are joining these companies, but also all the people who work around those well-paid uh, elites of the digital economies, 
and operating services, driving cars, selling stuff in um, uh, stores, etc. So, and even civil servants have to be there because it's what it's where everybody's located. So you can't operate a civil uh, a public service if you're not in the cities. And in the c cities, the problem is there's not much space. And you can see that that what happens when uh, a city turns uh, uh, converts completely to the digital economy, suddenly real estate prices go, uh, go to the roof and people can't afford a house anymore. And the reason why, uh, one of the major reasons why the, the digital economy fails to create uh, jobs for less educated people is because, it, it's not because we have no imagination about what jobs should be created. It's because those people can't afford a house where we need them to be. So uh, covering that new risk, that uh, it takes a radical effort of imagination. What social insurance, what welfare state could we invent to cover people against the major risks of not being able to afford a house where there are jobs for them to... to, to, to to, to be done. So uh, another major risk is mass intermittent un 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 unemployment. As we work, as we don't work full time for a whole career for the same employers, as we both turn to being an entrepreneur, being a freelancer, uh, or being a wage earner but in a company that will uh, go bankrupt in a few months, then suddenly there are more and more periods where we are in between two jobs or we are accumulating different jobs or we are both working uh, on, on something that's boring but rewarding economically and something that is inspiring like creating arts or helping others. And so in that economy where intermittent employment becomes a, the, not the exception but the norm, we have to adapt radically our welfare state to covering people beyond one particular job. We have to cover them as they have two jobs or three jobs uh, um, simultaneously, or we have to cover them as, as the term for when, from wage earners to entrepreneurs to freelance to unemployed to wage earners again, and so on and so on. So this is Sarah Horowitz. Uh, she's there and she'll be with us in the panel and I didn't know uh, that we, we'd met just right after and she founded in the US uh, the freelancers union with a very powerful message this is in the previous model freelancers were shameful they were the, ex the frightening exception uh, for all of us wage earners and uh, they were so marginal that Nothing was, uh, no institution existed to cover them uh, against the major risks they, incur, uh, they encountered on the market. But suddenly, in the digital economy, you can be proud of being a freelance. You can, um, uh, you can affirm that you're, willing, that you're not a freelance because you're a victim, you didn't find a, a, a wage job, but you're freelance because you prefer to work without a boss, to, pr to choose your own clients, to alternate between period where, where you work a lot, a period where you take care, when you take care of your child or you, you create arts or other, or other things. And the Freelancers Union, but she, she'll tell more about that, was created to help freelancers to, to, to empower them in, in the, the economy and to deploy for them uh, what looks like a, a very small welfare state, but more adapted to the needs of the workers in the digital economy, especially when it comes to finding a house or uh, uh, being take, taken care of when you're sick. So um, one of the major accomplishments of this union is to, to have, uh, they have created they created um, a healthcare insurance for their members and even centers where you can go to, to, to be cured when you're ill. So uh, what are the responses? One response is basic income. People say, oh, because since we'll all switch between being employed, being unemployed, creating startups, then joining a, a big company, uh, why not? cover everybody with a basic income that will help everybody to you know, be free and afford whatever it takes to, to live decently. 
I personally don't believe in that solution at all because it's not because you put some money in the pocket of everyone that suddenly everybody can have a decent house or being cured when they're sick. Not at all, because those two examples uh, suffice to, to, to understand the problem. Those are markets with a very rigid supply. Real estate is obviously very rigid. Healthcare too, for different reasons. It's not because you have money uh, that you can be cured or you can find a house. And so basic income alone cannot solve all the problems cannot cover all the risks to which people are exposed in the digital age. Another solution is, well, uh, because uh, people don't find jobs in the private sector, maybe the government should create those jobs or, sub uh, or create subsidies so, so that jobs in elderly care or, or health care or child care are sustainable. But the problem with that is that the government is incapable of, you know, creating the new business models that we need to take care of people on a personal, uh, personal um, uh, with customized service. Uh, the government is, uh, knows how to create mass-produce public services, but it doesn't know, it, the, the, gov the government is not an entrepreneur, and it, it is in incapable of creating new business models that people expect when, when it comes to being served been taken care of in, in, the, in this economy. So the response may be in a particular mod model pro promoted and uh, actually implemented, uh, which had been implemented for a long time in northern European countries, which is called flex security. It's com to combine flexibility for the companies and flexibility of, of the job uh, labor market and security for the particular individuals that come that, uh, that, that go from job to job uh, in a very high, fluid, and entrepreneurial economy. So, Olaf Palme is, uh, used to be the prime minister in Sweden. He's one of the great figures of that social democratic doctrine. I think social democracy has a very uh, promising uh, future in the digital economy because those guys uh, reflected on how to combine innovation, entrepreneurship, and security for individuals. And it's only at those, that condition that you can create wealth, redistribute it, and make our countries developed countries again. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Merci.